Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Beyond Black and White. So I'm just going to reiterate our goals for this time together and then dive into talking about some takeaways from last week. So for those of you who are here, I'm going to invite you to be thinking about any particular takeaways that felt significant to you from the last time we were together. Uh, but the goals of our time together are to learn. We're going to be talking a lot about the history of the Bible and about various moments in that history and the process of canonization. And then also the process of how we got to a more literalist approach to reading the Bible. Then we'll also um, do some unlearning we're going to maybe challenge some assumptions that we have about the biblical texts and about ways that we might approach them. And then lastly, the goal is empowerment so that we as contemporary readers of these texts can feel empowered to find creative, thoughtful ways to integrate them into our lives with integrity. And so, with that, I want to ask uh, those of you who were here last week or had a chance to watch the recording from last week, are there any takeaways that you're bringing from that class into this one as we prepare to dive into uh, some more of this conversation? Oh, Diane, I see that you're talking, but you're muted. It's tricky to unmute on a phone. Uh -huh. Let me see. I can prompt you to unmute. Let me see if this will work. Did a little window pop up? No, it's not working. Well, darn it. All right, you keep working and then we'll... Um, Maybe she could put it in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. On a phone that might be... Oh, that's hard too. <laughs> hmm. If you're able to, um, Diane, unmute, just feel free to jump in whenever you can. What about other folks? Any other takeaways from, from last time? Yeah, Gail. Um, I remember being surprised that reading the Bible literally came so late in our history. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to, uh, to think about that because I, I think for a lot of us, depending on how the Bible was presented to us, the literalist approach is presented as the only approach that's mm -hmm. ever been. And, <laughs> uh, and that's just certainly not the case. Thanks, Gail. What about other folks? Any other takeaways from last time? All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and move into today's conversation? And that's going to be about the canonization process of the New Testament. Last week, we talked about the history behind the uh, New Testament texts. And to that end, I actually want to just take a quick moment, um, sort of as review, as we were talking last week, one of the things that we discussed was how the presentation of the New Testament texts was actually not very much at all like what we see in the English translation of the Bible. There were no punctuation marks. There were no quotation marks. There were no chapter separations. There were no verse separations. So I just wanted to show you a picture, actually, of one of the earliest uh, New Testament texts that we have. And so you can just have a, a sense of what some of these papyrus texts looked like. So this is a copy of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And it's one of the earliest fragments of a papyrus that we have. Many of the, the papyri that we have from the New Testament are fragments. And so this is one of the best maintained and earliest uh, fragments that we have. 
A carbon dating process puts this maybe around 200, somewhere around 200 AD, give or take a couple of um, a couple of decades. So again, it isn't an original copy. Paul did not write this. This is a copy um, that someone else had written. Any thoughts or questions about this, sort of to foreground our conversation moving into the history of the canonization process? Mm -hmm. Tony, did you say this was in Greek? That's right. Exactly, Susan, yeah. And that's the language that, um, as far as as far as we know, all of the New Testament texts were originally written. There's some debate about Matthew, that maybe Matthew was actually first written in Hebrew or Aramaic, and then later translated to Greek, but we don't know that for sure. But yeah, all of the texts were written in Greek, and many of them looked very much like this. Okay, so... I'm gonna ask you all a question. If you were asked to uh, give sort of a collection of texts that would best capture the values and history of the United States, what texts would you include in that list? <clears throat> or might be one or a couple that you might include. A constitution. Constitution, yeah, absolutely. Sort of a founding document, pivotal to the formation of the United States. Yeah, what else? Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence, also a pivotal text for sure. Emancipation Proclamation. Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, yeah. Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg Address, okay. Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream Speech. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream Speech, yeah. Relatedly, some people might include Martin Luther King's letter to Birmingham from Birmingham Jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've got a list of texts. Um, as it happens, all the texts that we've named so far are from men. And that's a result of our history and also probably to a certain extent our, our cultural condition. <laughs> um, I'm sure if we, we talk more, we would list more texts by more diverse authors. Um, but we've <laughs> listed both official legal documents and then also non-legal documents. Documents that kind of represent in one way or another or speak to in one way or another values we hold and think are important um, up into in understanding what the United States is all about. I ask this question because the texts that we pick in a process like that are going to, even if they are speaking to some of the same kinds of values, they may come at those values in different ways. And that's very much like what happened with the formation of the New Testament. We had a lot of the, the um, those folks involved in that process had a lot of texts to choose from, but they only chose 27 when it came down to it. So let's talk a little bit about how we got to that point. So I'm going to just take you through um, some history, a couple hundred years, in fact, of history um, pretty quickly. So if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt and I'll pause and ask for questions at different times. So this is Marcion of Sinope. And that's actually that person is this one right here with his face scratched out. Over here, folks think that this is um, the Apostle John. And what do you notice is happening in this painting right here? handing him something a book yeah there's a book right here between them john seems to be handing it over or or maybe even just pointing at something yeah what else do you notice it looks to me he's writing in that book and like the guy's holding an inkwell for him <laughs> yeah right 
We've got maybe this is a stylus of some sort. We got an inkwell over here. Yeah. 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 For some reason, he has his feet rested on like a thing, but the other guy doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. John's feet are propped up on maybe just a pedestal, maybe a book. Um, but his feet are, are definitely propped up and Marcion's feet are just here on the ground. Also, I'll just point out that John here has a halo and Marcion oh. does not. And so what we're seeing here is sort of a visual summary of a pretty extreme controversy that happened in the early church. And so Marcion of Sinope was according to it, the history that we know, one of the very first people to ever try to put together an authoritative list of New Testament documents. This was around 130 CE, and he basically distilled down the Christian canon into a couple of texts, what he called the Gospel of the Lord, which was based on Luke, but had no references, as Luke does, to any Hebrew scriptures. And he included also in his canon um, some of the epistles from Paul. And so he was actually, scholars think, one of the first people to compile Paul's epistles um, from the various places that Paul had written those letters to. Now, the issue came when it when it came to the question of what to do with the hebrew scriptures and as i just mentioned marcion decided that the references to the hebrew scriptures had no place in the christian scripture because according to marcion there were two different gods captured in the story of the hebrew scriptures and what he was trying to form into a christian set of scriptures and so the God of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, Marcion decided was a jealous creator God, and that the God who sent Jesus was a different God, actually. And so what we had then was Marcion saying, we don't need to pay attention. Christians don't need to pay attention to the Hebrew scriptures. In fact, the story of Jesus and the witness of Jesus creates an entirely new story. And that's the story we need to focus on. It's a story oriented around a different God, in fact. And so Marcion actually was the person who kind of catalyzed and began in a formal, a more formal way, the process of trying to say what was Christian scripture. And he was also one of the first people to say that, in fact, we have, yes, the, the Hebrew scriptures translated into Greek, which we talked about last time, the Septuagint. However, Marcion said, we can dispense with that. And God has created, or this new God is creating a different testament, a different kind of covenant. And so he also is accredited uh, with the delineation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, obviously, his, his approach to this did not win out, because in the Holy Bible, the Holy Christian Bible, both sets of texts are contained, but he began the process um, in trying to separate out what we might identify as Christian scriptures. Any questions about him or that that piece of this history? Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, Tony, the Torah just has the first five books of the Bible, and that's it? That's right. Yeah, the Torah is considered the first five books, also kind of known as tra uh, through tradition as the books of Moses. Okay. That's right. But the Hebrew scriptures contain not only the Torah, but the writings of the prophets, um, Isaiah, through the major prophets to the minor prophets like Amos and Hosea, and then also writings like the Song of Solomon, the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, what have you. Oh, so if you were Jewish, you would be studying that stuff too? 
Yeah, it was all, yeah, it was all part of um, the Hebrew scriptures. That's right. I see. So writing against Marcion um, were a number of people. And one of the most well-known was Saint, now sainted, Irenaeus. And so this is a, a stained glass window from a church in Lyon, which is, um, according to history and tradition, the place where Irenaeus really did a lot of his, his work in evangelizing and helping to create orthodoxy and what have you in modern day France. And so um, this, is a, this is a stained glass window from a church in France, actually. And so he wrote a book called Against Heresies. And in this book, he argues against Marcionism, which we were just talking about. He argues against the Ebionites, who were a Christian sect that said the Gospel of Matthew was the authoritative text, and we don't need to pay attention to any others. And there were actually various Christian groups that were doing this thing of saying, we know which gospel is the authoritative gospel. Marcion, Irenaeus writes, thinks that Luke is the authoritative gospel, even though he made some modifications to it. There were other people who thought Mark was the authoritative gospel and John and so on. And so Irenaeus says actually that in order to understand Christian theology best, you need all four gospels. And so he writes in book three, chapter two of um, this book called Against Heresies, he writes the following. It is not possible that the gospels can be either fewer or more in number than they are. For since there are four zones of the world in which we live and four principal winds, while the gospel is scattered throughout all the world and the pillar and the ground of the God of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life. It is fitting that she should have four pillars, breathing out life on every side and vivifying men afresh. Yes. So you see in that an argument for these four gospels, not necessarily grounded at least only in theology, or, or scripture or tradition even, but Irenaeus is making an argument about having four gospels that's grounded in the way the world functions, the way the cosmos is organized. Four winds, four pillows, pillars, four zones in the world. And so again, we, we were getting this work of trying to clarify and explain and establish what the authoritative texts really need to be. And so Irenaeus sort of sets us up with the idea that there are, uh, the gospel is actually a fourfold uh, text that has these different folds in it and they need to be read together. Even though there are inconsistencies, you still need to read them together in order to get a fuller sense of who Jesus was and what our theology needs to be. Any thoughts or questions about, about that piece of this? Okay, let's fast forward some to Constantine. So Emperor Constantine was a, um, a Roman emperor and before he assumed the throne, the Roman Empire had been split into different zones. And so Constantine decided that he wanted to reunify the Roman Empire. And so he went into a series of battles with other kind of co-emperors that were stationed in various places. And he was successful. In one of those battles, he catches a glimpse of a cross. Before this time, he was, he was not Christian, but he has this vision of a cross. In fact, when he's on a bridge, and here's a painting of that moment um, done by Rubens. And so you see here Emperor Constantine, 
um, in the throes of what might be some sort of battle with all of these soldiers decked out in full regalia. And then we see this light coming from beyond, descending down towards him, and he has his arms open, ready to receive it. And this is, again, a kind of stylized depiction of what is essentially a story about why Constantine decided to convert to Christianity. And so Constantine makes this choice. He doesn't say after he does this that Christianity needs to be the religion of the entire Roman Empire. That happens later. But what he does do is pass what's called the Edict of Milan, which legalizes Christianity. So suddenly Christian groups are no longer persecuted in the ways that they had been, and they can apply for permits to gather. And so land that had been taken and seized by the Roman Empire is returned to churches um, or, or they're compensated in some kind of way. Christian symbolism makes its way into Roman money and in depictions of Constantine. And so we're seeing an effort on, on behalf of the Roman Empire to normalize Christianity in a much more concerted way to um, help people understand that this isn't any longer some sort of underground sect that has to be hidden, but actually not only is there legal space for Christianity to, to exist, but the emperor himself is in fact a professed Christian. What that meant for Constantine isn't exactly clear because he still also included imagery um, in sort of official architecture that he was responsible for building um, pagan representations of the Roman gods and what have you. And so it was clear that he didn't take an exclusive approach to his Christianity. However, it was still very much a part of what his work was as an emperor and, and who he was, or at least who he's remembered to be as a person um, in history. So once this happens, though, and we have all of these competing ideas about what the Christian texts need to be and who's who's to say what they are, and also competing ideas about theology, then suddenly there's a need to unify, to start setting down clarity about who's correct, essentially. And so that prompts, um, excuse me, I don't know if you can hear my dog, but they're having a party downstairs. Um, that prompts Constantine to organize what's called the First Nicene Council. And that was really to settle some theological issues rather than scriptural issues. Um, and, and mainly those theological issues had to do with Jesus and whether Jesus was created by God, had always existed, what Jesus's divinity exactly was. And so the first council of Nicaea, which produces the Nicene Creed, excuse me, basically creates the term homoousius, which is a Greek word that means of the same substance. And so the idea was that in the Nicene Creed, that Jesus was begotten, not made. And so the idea, again, being that Jesus wasn't created from God, but that Jesus and God are the exact same substance. There wasn't a whole lot of talk at the, at least not recorded by history, um, about scriptures at the first Nicene Council. However, it's important to note that the process of trying to clarify and offer authority about what was orthodox theology fundamentally shapes the whole conversation around which texts become authoritative when it comes to canonizing the New Testament. So are you saying with this Nicene Creed that their thought is that Jesus is not the son of God, but is God kind of taking human form? Is that what you're saying? 
Essentially, I mean, that language of, of Jesus being son of God still, still carries, but the idea that Jesus was created from God and that they are essentially two different kinds of substances, two different kinds of divinity is put to rest as, as not accurate. And also the other controversy that the Nicene Creed was grappling with or council was grappling with was whether or not Jesus retained divinity in the same way that God did. Because there was um, sort of a hierarchy that was developing among some Christians that said God the Father is the, really the primary God and Jesus is just derivative of that. And actually within the Unitarian um, the Unitarian faith, they credit Arian, who was the person who sort of was attested to uh, the, the, this, this theology was linked with as one of their forefathers, because they read Arian as saying, essentially uh, offering a kind of Unitarian theology, that there is really just one God and Jesus was an exceptional uh, connect, uh, exceptionally connected to that God. And so the Nicene Council gets together and says, no, that is not what we are going to hold as Orthodox Christian teaching, that in fact, Jesus and God, and then also later the Holy Spirit are all one God with three different manifestations. Okay. So the, the, the story of how theology shifts over time is, is really interesting and incredibly complex and has a lot to do with sort of Roman politics as the, the Roman Empire is sort of trying to figure out how it's going to move forward after being separated. And so the way that the, the, the story of the New Testament scriptures gets pushed into that is that suddenly the scriptures begin to become more and more critical as the kind of touchstone for the expression of this theology that's becoming orthodox, if you will. <laughs> and so after this moment of the Nicene Council, Constantine decides that he wants to continue the work of trying to unify theology, trying to unify a sense of what Christian identity was. And so he asks Eusebius, who was um, the Bishop of Rome and sort of part of Constantine's court as the Bishop of Rome, to create Bibles, to create texts that Constantine could then send to churches, um, particularly churches in the Eastern section of the Roman Empire, so that they could have a sense of what Christianity was really all about. And so he asks Eusebius to create 50 Bibles. And so these are called the 50 Bibles of Constantine. And here is a copy of one of them from um, one of the earliest that we have. And we don't exactly know if this is a, a papyrus that is extracted from one of those books themselves or as a later copy, but it gives you a sense of kind of the general character written in Greek with no real separations in the individual words, um, at least not discernible, I think, to, to many of our eyes, no punctuation in any real way, but there are separations because you can see this is, as you can see from the bottom, this is the ending of Luke and the beginning of John. And so we're getting a sense here of uh, these, this book has compiled various books into uh, on, even on a single piece of paper. And so it's sort of a, a story that's being told um, in, in a single bound, in a single bound text. And so Eusebius, this bishop from Rome writes that Constantine asked him to do the following. He says that Constantine said this, 
I have thought it expedient to instruct your prudence to order 50 copies of the sacred scriptures, the provision and use of which you know to be most needful for the instruction of the church, to be written on prepared parchment in a legible manner and in a convenient portable form by professional transcribers thoroughly practiced in their art. And so we're getting a sense here, again, of the canonization process, this move to make orthodoxy is really rooted in a desire for unity and, and a desire to kind of make clear exactly what the, the, the teachings of the church are going to be moving forward. Any questions or thoughts about that? Yeah, Carl. When you talk about the Bishop of Rome, <clears throat> I'm wondering how, how integrated is the Christian faith uh, within the masses at that point? Was, it, was the Bishop a, a separate entity from the government or was he, well, he was appointed, was he appointed by Constantine or how did he, how, was there yeah. a whole, structure of people who who said this guy's going to be the bishop how did that come to be yeah it's a good question this is before there was sort of this mixing of church and state if you will and so at this point there are bishops in pretty much uh in most of the major cities in the, in the ancient world um or the ancient mediterranean world anyway and they're elected and so in some of the controversies that end up needing to be um, settled through an orthodox teaching, what happens is that the official bishop has a sense of what theology or scripture is, and then the bishop who lost has a different sense of what theology and scripture is, and so that bishop starts sharing that their own sense of what things are, sending letters to individual churches, visiting churches and preaching. And then so suddenly you have two different, within the same city or cultural context, two totally different senses of what the same religion is. And so um, in the case of Eusebius, he was part of Constantine's court, but he was elected. And so Constantine asks Eusebius to help him in this process of trying to create uniformity and also to stop what in some places were becoming violent disagreements about what the New Testament um, either was or what Christian theology was. Is that answering your question, Carl? Yeah. Yeah, when you say vote, does that mean that the, the public voted or uh, a group of people voted? Yeah, it was a group of people. It was, um, so yeah, Christianity was still a fairly minor religion, relatively speaking, even at this time. Um, I don't know how historians document this, but they, they put the number around 6 million in the Mediterranean world, whereas there were, again, I don't know how they, how they, compile these numbers, but they um, believe there maybe have been 11 or 12 million Jews in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is one of the questions that keeps coming up, in fact, that some of these movements to create orthodoxy and the scriptural debates are trying to address, even with Marcion back at the beginning of this process, what's the relationship between Christians and Jews? What's the relationship between um, the stories of Judaism and the Hebrew scriptures and the ongoing story of Jesus and his disciples and apostles in the modern, in that time, day church? And so this is what we'll see as time goes on. This is, in fact, a still live question. I, I read an article about... Um, an evangelical pastor who had declared to his church that they didn't really need to pay attention to the Old Testament, to the Hebrew scriptures, because it represents 
a completely different set of values, religious norms, and all they needed to do is focus on the New Testament. That's not orthodox. However, that's what this pastor said. And it's not as if because that pastor isn't part of some larger denomination that has set an orthodoxy. There's no orthodoxy police to come and say, you can't do that. We're going to defrock you. We're closing your, none of that. And so all that to say is that these questions are still very much alive today for Christians mm -hmm. in some places, anyhow. Right. Any other questions or comments? Tony, can, um, you know, one of the things I remember studying at some point was that a lot of the issue was about getting a set of, for a better word, rules and regulations so that everybody could be measured by that. But one of the arguments then was, is that that squelches the work of the Holy Spirit because it, he's going to speak things that are different to all of us. Uh, he's not necessarily going to say, he's not necessarily going to follow the rules. <laughs> um, but if we're to follow the Holy Spirit and live from our conscience and what we learn out of the word and from others, you're going to be different. Jesus was. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's a helpful consideration to bring into the conversation, Jeff, because, you know, what it also brings up is the question of, well, when does revelation stop? Yeah. How do we decide that after the book of Revelation, that there's no more scripture happening? There's no more sacred texts being produced. And as we'll see, um, it, as our conversation continues to evolve, not everyone agreed with that, which is how we get the book of Latter-day Saints, right? The book of right. Mormonism and how we get um, uh, Mary Baker Eddy from, of the Christian science world. Um, and how we get other revelations, how we get Islam. And um, so it's, it's, a re it's a really interesting question, Jeff. You know, what role does the Holy Spirit play in this process? And in what ways might deciding that we have suddenly official documents and official rules might crowd out the possibility that God is still working in ways that um, we're not making space for, perhaps. Well, the process of canonization continued to develop after those 50 Bibles of Constantine were shared and disseminated. Um, there's a whole variety of councils that continue to gather in various parts of the world, um, in Northern Africa, in modern day Turkey, in a whole variety of places. Eventually, though, we get in 382, the Council of Rome gathers, and they set the list of texts that becomes authoritative um, for, for several hundred years. And so in that same year, in 382, Jerome who um, was a prominent Christian at this time, was commissioned to write what was called the Vulgate Bible. And what that is, is as, as we've been seeing all these texts, they're written in Greek, right? And as the Roman Empire continued to evolve, more and more people were no longer speaking Greek as the primary language, they were speaking Latin. And so what Jerome did, what he was tasked with, was create, writing down the Bible, translating the Bible into Latin. And so that word vulgate is basically a, a way of saying common. It's sort of the common language. And so that's what he does. Here's, a, here's an excerpt, a picture of, uh, of a page from that Bible, or a copy of that Bible. And so here we're seeing um, more stylized writing. We're seeing um, a change in the way that the syntax of the sentences is even being organized. There are clearer spaces between words. We even have what looks to be sort of a footnote at the bottom here. 
Um, and it was a very common thing, in fact, for other people to write marginal notes about uh, a way that they were interpreting a text or um, or even in fact there are some um, copies of these ancient texts where it looks as if a monk or a translator or a scribe has written sort of a grocery list where there's just a lit because paper was in high demand right i mean it was expensive and so um, paper got used for all kinds of reasons but this is one of the first, we think, um, copies of the Vulgate Bible. That's 382. And so we're going to fast forward to 1455. And that is when Johannes Gutenberg decides to create um, or, or discovers the ability to um, create typeset. And that's when we get, I think many of us know that story of the beginning of the printing press. And so we get the first Gutenberg Bible. And it is basically a typeset version of the Vulgate Bible written in Latin. And, um, and so that enables the Bible suddenly to be shared much more widely. Um, it makes it less expensive, it makes it more accessible. And many people think that part of what spurred the Protestant Reformation was in fact making the Bible more accessible to people. A big tenet of Protestantism and, and that, that schism that happened was that individuals needed to have a relationship with the biblical text that wasn't mediated through a priest or some other official person, that uh, people, Christians, could just interact with the Bible themselves and learn teachings and wisdom and what have you. However, when that happened, the Catholic Church um, responded and with the formation of the Council of Trent. And that was between the years of 1545 and 1563. And that was the moment where we finally get to what we know as today as the canon of Christian scriptures of the New Testament. And, and in fact, the old, the Hebrew scriptures as well. And it was at that moment that the Catholic Church um, decided that here's the set of texts that we're going to be working with. Now, Protestants have a slightly different set of texts. The Orthodox, many Orthodox churches have a slightly different set of texts, but they all include basically the same, um, the same set of 27 texts as far as the New Testament is concerned, give or take a few. Um, the next time we get together, we're going to talk more about the Protestant Reformation, and we're going to talk more about how various traditions around reading and interpreting the Bible began to, uh, began to grow and get systematized. Um, before, before then, though, I just want to name a couple of overall concerns that we see play out in this story of the process of canonizing. One of the concerns that we've already talked about was harmonizing Jewish and Gentile cultures and religions. And we saw a couple of different approaches to that. One, there was a sense of a connectedness um, that, that Christians, early Christians felt as though the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, that was their scriptures. That was, and, and then there were um, not gospels, but actual memoirs of the apostles is how they were described. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were thought of as sort of the, the, the life and times of these folks with Jesus. It was only later that they became canonized as gospels. So there was, there was that approach, sort of um, letting the Septuagint be the main scripture for Christians. And then there was the approach to having two different sets of scripture, 
as articulated by Marcion, where there was the Hebrew scriptures that we could dispense with, and then the Christian scriptures that we needed to define and really read. And then where the story ended was with having actual a, a single set of composite scriptures, with the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament being considered the scriptures for Christians and having a continuity. And so in addition to harmonizing Jewish and Gentile cultures and, and texts, there was also the ongoing concern about Christians needing to secure their place in Roman society and politics. And so in a lot of the kind of extra peripheral writings of this time, you see people trying to reckon with what role the Roman Empire played in Jesus's death versus the role that his Jewish contemporaries played in Jesus's death. And so we see the beginnings of um, a, a kind of official, if you will, anti-Semitism making its way into the story of Christianity, where you see people like Eusebius, as we mentioned before, the Bishop of Rome and other folks blaming the Jews for Jesus's death. And so to what extent that actually shaped the way the gospels were written and translated and recorded is still sort of an open question. I mean, if you remember back to the moment um, in the gospels where Jesus is on trial, Pilate, I mean, he has an interesting role, right? It's not his fault um, that Jesus actually was crucified, right? In the story, Pilate makes this attempt to sort of ask, uh, ask the populace, well, okay, I could release two people, this horrible murderer or Jesus, what do you think? And they all say, crucify Jesus. And, and then Pilate has that big scene where he washes his hands of this. And so, again, there's this, there's this question among Christians about what the relationship with the powers and principalities of the Roman Empire was going to be. And it shaped the way they thought about um, theology and, and the canonization process of the New Testament scriptures. And then finally, the other concern that we have in this story is the effort to reinforce the, the, the emergence of orthodox theology. And so, as we talked about last time, there are several Gospels, not just those of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's the Gospel of Thomas, which was in fact included in some early lists of the New Testament scriptures. There's the Gospel of Mary. There's a whole variety of Gospels, but they articulate really different theologies in some of them. Um, they have different ideas about the divinity of Jesus. They have different ideas about um, what happened after Jesus died. And so in order to have clearly defined authoritative theology, there was an effort to say which books we were going to include to reinforce that theology. <clears throat> what questions are coming up for y'all? The question that I have, Tony, is what you said, uh, you have to have an authoritative, you know, but uh, for, it, it seems to be the old thing of dominion and against uh, inclusivity, yeah. just being exclusive, and it whittles it down and whittles it down. And you mentioned before about how just throw away the Hebrew scriptures and they'd have nothing to do with it. But so many were learning from uh, our other class that uh, a lot of the stories in the Hebrew Bible were written <laughs> in the New Testament uh, story of Lazarus, for example, there was an example of that particular story in the Hebrew Bible and also here. So I'm just wondering uh, 
when you say you need a an authoritative uh, in other words, this is the real thing. How can anybody <clears throat> trust that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, um, John, the point you're bringing up. And it's, it, it's even more interesting when you look at the different ways that the Roman, the parts, the different parts of the Roman Empire approach this question. And so the Western church went through all of this work to define orthodoxy and clearly demarcate which texts were part of the canon and which weren't. Whereas the Eastern Church, they had a much more laissez-faire approach to these questions. They didn't go through the process necessarily, uh, or at least not to the same extent as the Western Church, of doing this. And so the need for authority really came from the desire to expand and grow. It was more, I mean, so this is, this is sort of a theological question because some people might say that it was divinely orchestrated, that the process of canonization was, was led and guided by God, and that's how we got there. Whereas other folks might say this was sort of a function of administrative necessity that in order to grow in order to expand there had to be clarity about what was growing and what was expanding particularly as these different bishops were vying for power and authority they were appealing to their followers to say my approach to the question of jesus's divinity was correct another question that came up was who's able to be ordained Who's able to be ordained as an official of the church? There was a sect of people who said it had to be people who were morally righteous and clean. And then there was another sect that said, well, in fact, it's available to anyone if they're willing to do the work. And so suddenly, well, then whose who's pastors, whose priests are the right ones became a question. And so, yeah, that the, the, the issue of whether or not this process was necessary or divinely inspired um, or, again, a consequence of, of the need for administrative ease, it's sort of an open question and depends on, on the way you see these, these sorts of things and, and this history. Yeah, Gretchen. I can't see um, I, I didn't miss the last time, but what I'm thinking is like, I mean, what I was really amazed at is that Constantine would make that effort, which seems very inclusive to me in the first place. And then that, I mean, it seems like he's like, you know, as you said, it's this Greek gods and stuff were still kind of active, but also uh, Christianity and an effort to not exclude. But anyway, and then how these various efforts to codify end up, what starts out as an effort to include ends up at, often as an effort is exclusive. Mm -hmm. So it's like there are mm -hmm. these like growth and <laughs> and, then, and then narrowing and then growth and then narrowing and I don't know it remind, I'm reading a book now called Proust and the Squid which talks about how essentially what you hear all the time new ways of thinking can't old ways you can't come up solve problems with the, um, the thinking that you created them with. Yeah, can't solve new problems with like old these, ways of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So like this old, so the effort to, originally the effort to include more people and gather them into your fold, then kind of tightens up and it's like, well, what do we want this fold to be? And then what shouldn't it be, you know? 
It's- That's right. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it kind of brings us back to our very first conversation about what the purpose of any scripture is for any religion, for any culture, and, and any canon is. And part of what it does is help solidify an identity so that a group of people who are otherwise not related by familial ties, and maybe in some instances aren't related through language, can find a co- something in common. And so if we, if we think back to this moment in around the fourth century during the Mediterranean world, there was incredible diversity, language diversity, religious diversity, a huge amount of difference. And so part of what this effort was, I think, was to help solidify and and create a common identity among a, a, a really diverse group of people. Now, the way they did that um, was through codification, legal edicts, and in some cases, violence, in fact. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, as, as modern day readers of these, of these texts and of the Bible, what it invites us to think about is what kind of relationship we want to have with these texts. Knowing that the, the journey to getting to the Bible was fraught and was confused and happened in fits and starts, whether we're talking about the Hebrew scriptures in that process or the New Testament scriptures in that process. And so what it invites us to do is as we're reading any one of these texts is that we can consider the context as one more source of inspiration, as one more source of of, um, interpretation, as we're thinking about how we might apply these scriptures to us today. And as we look around at the world that we're living in, a place that is incredibly diverse, made up of Uh, people of various religions and language backgrounds and perspectives, it invites us to think about how we might want to talk about our religion in a way that makes it accessible and inclusive, rather than doing the work of saying that if you're not Christian, then you're not right, or you're going to hell, or you can't be included, or X, Y, or Z. Um, this process invites us to think about how we might want to carry these scriptures into our everyday lives, knowing, knowing the history that they, that they bring with them. Any final questions or comments? Yeah, Pan. Just I, um, in all this process, I heard the word dominion used and, um, it's so male. And um, for me, that examination and that learning has to be and has to include uh, a deeper understanding of where is female within this and how is there balance and really how is there harmony or is it in fact uh, uh, overloaded with male dominion? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and as we're as we're looking at this history, almost all of the pivotal figures that we're talking about are men. The people who are making these decisions or initiating these decisions or what have you, they tend to be men. And in looking at that history, compared with the history that's even preserved in the in the New Testament, the history of certain apostles and the the story of certain deacons. We have stories of strong leadership of women. Priscilla um, was oh. an early Christian. Yeah, yeah, your namesake. Yeah, um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Thecla. I mean, the, there's there there are stories of some of the earliest Christians who were women that were celebrated <laughs> in the ancient world. But a lot of those stories drop out in this process. Yeah. And um, and again, as I mentioned, there was a gospel according to Mary. Um, there, there, there were other ways that Christianity made space for this diversity 
that we're talking about that started to get more and more narrowly um, defined in the process of canonization. Yeah. The next time we get together, we're going to push this history that much more closer toward the present. And we're going to look at the medieval church in particular, um, and then the process of deciding what were the sanctioned ways of reading and interpreting the Bible. And again, we'll, we'll begin to start having the conversation about literalism and what it means today versus even what it meant then. Because that word shows up in various texts during this time, uh, during the medieval age, but it is thought of in a really different way than we are thinking about it today. And so that'll kind of foreground our conversation about the modern way of reading the texts that really began in a, in a kind of concerted authoritative way in the United States. So with that, I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you for your comments, your insights, your questions, and I look forward to being with you again next week. Thanks, Thanks. Tony. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Bye. Bye.